studio with the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, former Berkeley County Commission President as well. Good morning, Rob. Great to see you. And the former publisher, editor of the uh, journal here in uh, Martinsburg, Maria Lawrenson. And uh, Maria, I'm sure you saw that Mr. Nutting passed away at the age of uh, 87. Um, he was a really incredible man. Yeah. Just um, kind and um, and considerate and um, and a newspaper magnate. Had a lot of newspapers around the country. Oh, fact. my gosh. Yeah. It started in West Virginia. I mean, they started, um, you know, the Wheeling Intelligencer, then mm -hmm. the Wheeling Re News Register, and then um, expanded throughout West Virginia and Ohio. And now it's a... Uh, um, a really large operation throughout mostly the Midwest and over um, to uh, you know to here mm -hmm. they um, uh, funny little side story um, one of the things that I used to joke about was you know that you could move from paper to paper and if you wanted to you know to expand the depth and breadth whatever you you had to move that was the way it worked within the company and <laughs> At one point, um, they owned newspapers and still do, I believe, in the Dakotas. And one of the ads that came about uh, when there was an opening for a publisher's spot, I believe, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, was Why Not My Not? <laughs> um, and so. Because it's joked, too cold, that's why. I know. And I joked with. Uh, not then Judge Lawrenson, but I'm like, well, what do you think? And he just looked at me and was like, no, no. Who would want to go to Minot? So well, we did not. You so. did not go to Minot. Yeah. We did not. Hey, our uh, guest here is Senate Finance Chairman mm -hmm. Eric Tarr. Uh, Senator Tarr, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Well, good morning. Thanks for having me on. Any uh, thoughts about going to Minot at any <laughs> point along the way, Eric? Yeah, no, not today. I think the West Virginia weather here is just beautiful today, and uh, I'll hang out here and put together. Hey, uh, a couple of things here. Uh, first and foremost, uh, as we approach the end of the month of August, we're up to the 30th here, so there's one more day for the state to co collect uh, revenues. Have you gotten a track on how the August numbers are going to look at this point? Yeah, I think they're going to be fairly close to estimates. Um, if uh, they're a little above, a little below, kind of like they were last month. Uh, you know, last month we were around 300,000 um, above the estimate. And so some of that is quarterly uh, we have quarterly severance taxes that get uh, paid, and so this they were uh, didn't fall in the first quarter like they normally do. They'll fall in the second quarter, so we'll see those here another couple of months on on a bump on those. But um, other than that, I think we're going to track fairly close. Um, it's uh, but the numbers won't be in until uh, won't have them nailed down until September first. Obviously, yes. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the situation with WVU. Uh, certainly, uh, there was a lot of publicity over the interchange you had with AFT West Virginia President Randy Weingarten in regards to placing blame on the WVU revenue shortfalls. I see this morning now that there's a possible vote of no confidence coming for President Gordon Gee maybe in the next week as well. Uh, your thoughts on the financial situation there and how it's being handled? So I think what W is doing now is responsible, um, finally, uh, on how things are tracking. You know, the, we've had budget presentations from both WVU and Marshall over the past couple of years, and the appropriations that come from the state budget to our, educa our higher education institutions, and especially WVU and Marshall, are significant. But what we've never done until the past two years is actually break out those two universities to individually present their budgets. And the um, previously what had happened is you'd have the Higher Education Policy Commission who kind of goes over things as a whole on the spending on higher education in West Virginia. And so as they came in, one of the things that, uh, um, that was common to both Gordon Gee's presentation and to Brad Smith's uh, presentation, president of Marshall University, is that across the nation is that there's red flags for higher education institutions failing. Um, and not not just being constrained, but failing. And some of those estimates among the higher education community um, are estimating as high as 50% of the schools across the country failing in the next decade. And so when they're looking at that, they're forecasting what drives revenues and what drives expenses. 
And, of course, one of the revenue generators that comes into higher education is state funding. But aside from state funding, it's how many students do you have? You know, do you what students are you attracting? Are they in-state or the out-state? And what's that look like? And the metrics on that end are going down significantly. Uh, there's there's much fewer students who are coming from high school into our four-year institutions nationwide than have been in the past. And even in spite of knowing that, higher education across the country has been spending like there's no tomorrow. Um, the the spending has has way outpaced what what their revenue could ever provide. So. If you do that in your business, and if we do that in state um, or anything else that, that intends to survive financially, you have to adjust. And what higher education, by and large, has not done in the United States is adjust to that changing economy. Now, it changed even more rapidly when COVID hit. Uh, with COVID, it, it changed how higher education is accessed. It's also changed uh, career paths. Just, you know, how, how do you make money? as somebody who's entering the workforce. Um, Those things then accelerated, I believe, some of this decline. And to the very first thing, I would say that any, I would advise any university, um, whether it's WU or anybody else, that in the face of that, you have to look at how you're prioritizing your spending and does it match that new market. And that is what WU is doing now. And it's painful. Um, you know, I hate it for the professors and, and students that uh, are affected that as they come in. But you're talking um, on a $45 million shortfall. You're talking 10% or less of a, of a budget cut uh, or spending cut that they have on their gross revenue. And we're not telling WU that, um, you know, we're not going to tell them to do it. They're electing to do it. But I would, I'm, I'm highly supportive of them doing it. And it's nothing we haven't done at a state level as well. Bill. Yeah, uh, good morning, Senator. First, I would like to commend you. You're always very informed and you're very frank and open in your opinion. I appreciate that very much. Uh, But picking up on the uh, WVU situation, uh, one of the justifications, and you just mentioned, was lack of enrollment. enrollment. And this is where uh, uh, Randy Weingarten, the president of of American Federation of Teachers, came in and said they thought the, the... actions taken by WVU were draconian and also unnecessary. And you, in turn, responded uh, with an op-ed piece that said, basically, stay out of our business. Uh, we do not need socialists telling us how to, to get involved. Uh, contrast that with uh, with what we heard recently from Marshall. Uh, Marshall's enrollment has actually gone up. They've emphasized retention uh, of students. They've, they've uh, have a good record of recruitment. We're seeing the same thing to lesser degree, uh, maybe the same degree, I don't know, with, uh, with Shepherd University. Uh, they, neither one has suffered the same, same uh, loss of enrollment is what WVU has. Uh, If you contrast WVU with some of the other schools, is it possible that Weingarten perhaps was was correct? You know, it's a good question, but I'm I'm going to say that no, she's not correct. Um, And I want to kind of um, come back to, first of all, uh, who that's coming from Um, and how she said it. You know, in in Weingarten's statement, She said out of concern for the students, the American Federation of Teachers has never had the first concern for any student in this country. Their concern is, as a teacher's union, is how much can they bleed from a system uh, to their members to keep that union strong. And even in statements by Weingarner herself, she said that their union is not about students. So for them to come out and say, you know, this is um, a, a statement of benevolence to students, is as about as ironic a thing as, as you'll ever see. So first of all, just know that they started out the lie right off the bat. Second thing is is that um, the there are there are institutions that um, go up and down. So as far as student enrollment, and and they absolutely do. And going back to those budget presentations and talking to Marshall and WVU, one of the things that's um, uh, the Marshall has been able to do because they're a smaller school. 
I think some of your smaller schools that are more nimble and can um, react a little quicker to market changes, you're probably going to see them adapting quicker and those that survive. I do expect Marshall's going to thrive down here with a lot of the changes they've been making as well. And those were included in those budget presentations. You know, I'm, I saw we had when we had uh, both Brad and Gordon come in uh, for two different years in a row now, it wasn't just about the forecast globally. Both of those those university presidents acknowledged that nationally this is the trend we're seeing and we have to adapt and get ready for this new economy. Marshall's done that. And to give you an idea, you know, what there's the the just a straight appropriation, there's much more that we appropriate to these schools is the appropriation to Marshall I think is around fifty million dollars and to WU's around hundred and thirty million dollars just in proper now. Beyond that, there's it gets up into W. It's north of three hundred between three and four hundred, uh, three hundred and four hundred million dollars total. By the time you start putting everything into it, um, so those those appropriations are very strong. But to give you the idea of the difference in scale of those two universities, and Shepherd is another one. You know, if you look at scale, our flagship West Virginia University is a much much larger institution, and until this and and their 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 faculty senate is incredibly more resistant to change. This is a second vote of no confidence on Gordon Gee. And Gordon's the ones putting him out self out there saying, we have got to change how we operate if we're going to continue to be a flagship institution going forward. And you have a faculty senate coming out saying no, spend more, spend more, spend more, don't change. And they've been spending uncontrollably for the past couple decades. So that has got to change. And you know, and the other thing that we've we not only are am I saying that personally, the legislature has said that. We did in um in twenty twenty two, um, I championed and had a lot of support for a higher education funding formula. And prior to passing that funding formula, the way you appropriated a higher education, whether it was West Virginia University or any other one of the schools, it was how strong was your lobby and what did we do last year. That's how higher education has been historically funded in West Virginia until 2024, this coming uh, fiscal year. And looking at that, it seemed as finance chair, I came in as finance chair 2021. So I was elected in 18, served 1920, and became finance chair in 21. And looking at these large appropriation levels, I'm looking, why in the world don't we have an objective way to fund higher education instead of depending on lobbyists to say, that depend on the influence of lobbyists to determine how much we have in, in that budget for them. So we started looking at other states. Um, we modeled after two states that have had a good bit of success with the outcomes in their educational systems and who also have funding formulas, and that's Texas and Tennessee. So we went in and um, with the Higher Education Policy Commission, some legislators, and with the university president went through and says, said, you know, how should we look at funding for higher education? That formula goes in and it weights up and down metrics that improve the outcomes for education in West Virginia. So not only is Gordon Gee coming in and saying that we need to change, he knows that form of that funding formula extremely well. And I would encourage every university president in the state of West Virginia to get to know that very well. Because the way that that starts, that starts out with what are the educational needs to put paychecks in graduates' pockets in West Virginia and abroad. That's, that's, that's where it starts. And that has not been the case in higher education in West Virginia um, historically. So um, it doesn't surprise me that there's another vote of no confidence from the faculty senate at WVU. Um, we are not going to continue this liberal spending path that has got us in this position. So that's, yeah. that's at least from my perspective. Uh, the uh, the label of the flagship university carries with it uh, added responsibility, and I think, and from my perspective, this is what makes the problem even more difficult. Uh, to be the flagship, you you have to be a leader in so many different areas, uh, and that includes not only those things that specifically train someone to get an immediate job, but also the linguists, the uh, the advanced mathematicians, and uh, and you can go the list goes on the uh, uh, some of the mining engineers and the like uh, it's some of these uh, 
less well-known or less popular from the students' areas that are subject to being uh, downsized. Uh, and the, a strong arg- argument can be made for that. However, looking for the longer-term picture, there's going to be a collateral damage done somewhere as well because of the flagship university. So um, let me first of all tell you my my support of higher ed. So personally, I have a bachelor's in health science, I have a doctorate in physical therapy, and I have a master's in business administration. So um, I have a great appreciation for higher education. Um, I was one of the first in my family to actually go through and, and get degrees. And now my brother is also a doctor has bachelor's and master's and his wife, same situation, and uh, my kids. Uh, I got one that's a doctor and uh, another one that's uh, working on his master's. So I, I have a, a strong appreciation, and um, I feel like um, a decent understanding for higher education as well because I've also taught in systems. Um, so we want our flagship university to be able to offer all those type of things you just said. We're not telling them not to offering. We're telling them to get yourself in a financial position so that you can. Um, the, the trajectory for WVU, um, without you know, reaching way down deep into their endowment in years to come, if they, if they don't get it straight, has placed them in a position to where financially they don't have the, the freedom to offer those programs that don't drive revenue to the university. So, Senator, um, one of the things that has been floating around out there are, and it always is during times like this, um, are administrative salaries. You know, you look at the top of the, at the top of the heap, obviously coaches make um, big money, uh, but also, um, you know, Gordon Gee, his, um, you know, the folks in the front office, if you will. Are you concerned at all with that? Do you think that those are aligned with um, with how things should be? Or is that something totally separate from this um, piece that you're talking about? I don't think it's totally separate. Uh, I think it's it's part of what all has to be looked at because market drives all this. You know, I, I started out in this discussion talking about the higher education economy and how that's changing and market driving the changes that are necessary in the university. Market drives those same salaries. Um, if, you're, if you're going to have a um, phenomenal university president, if you're going to have a phenomenal coach, and you're competing with other universities to get those, you're going to have to pay at some level to do that. And when you get those individuals, they put a team around them that makes them successful. Um, because it's, it's, uh, I think in any one of those type people, when you talk to them, it's their, their performance is not solely based on them. Their performance is the ability to build a team around them, but that drives their, their market value. So I think that you probably see some of that in those administrative salaries. So to go in and say, this is exactly what anybody in one of those positions should be paid, um, uh, is, it's not to me, and it's not. And that, honestly, that's not what we're even done with the funding coming to say. And what you should be paid, it says what percentage of what goes into higher education will you receive, based on you meeting the market. And so, I think those administrative positions are probably fall in that category as well. Our guest on the program is the Senate uh, Finance Chairman Eric Tarr. In the article that I read about this dust up, it cited. Uh, the claim that uh, there has been a 24% cut to funding to WVU from the state legislature over the last 10 years. Uh, Eric, do you agree with that? Is that mathematically correct? Yeah, it probably is. There's been a drop in um, the overall funding in the past 10 years. If you go back and look at what's happened um, in a 10-year time frame, um, in 2014, when... um, I, I'm going to recall back to my time of paying very close attention to budget numbers. And, um, my time around paying close attention to those budget numbers is 2014. So that starts, you know, around this decade. And when, when the legislature came in in 2014, um, there was a $250 million deficit. By the time we got to 2015, it was a $450 million deficit, and that's on about a $4.5 billion budget. 
And if you'll remember, Jim Justice, um, uh, Democrat Jim Justice, came in and in his state of the state address said he's going to raise taxes $450 million. In other words, he, he wants to go in and keep the spending going that was going on that got us in a $450 million hole. And not only keep that spending, he wants you to reach deeper into your paycheck to do it. And the legislature said no. And so what the legislature went back and did is they looked in and said, when can, where can we can reduce spending by $450 million? And it was politically difficult. It was incredibly difficult. And so those those legislatures in 2014 and 20, excuse me, 2015 and 2016 um, went in there and looked at how to get that done, and they did it. And then Jim Justice comes out and put a pile of cow manure on a silver platter inside the Capitol on top of that budget and said he wouldn't sign it. So now it comes around and claims success for what's happening in West Virginia on the economic growth, which is owed very little to nothing to him. So, but when that we started that, when I said, you know, we're not telling WU or any other school that you shouldn't do anything, we, we haven't been, had the political will to do ourselves, is that we right-size our spending, then went in and said, okay, now how do we prioritize that spending? How do we get objective measures behind that spending that produce results? And that's been the MO for the legislature moving forward. So in that process, when you cut spending, what happens at a budget at a state level, and this, we're trying to correct this now, too, and it's a very slow correction because it's a massive line-by-line -line budget if you do it right. In a state budget, what happens is is you see a top-line item. That top-line item might be $20 million, it might be $50 million, it might be $100 million. And then what you can't see very well is everything that falls behind that that gets spent out of that, that bolus of money. And so what ends up happening when you do cuts is you do across the board cuts because if you just go in and you pick it out line by line to try to figure it you you really don't know what you're touching when you go to cut that money and that's that has been designed by governor after governor after governor in order to be able to empower the executive just take transparency away from the process so the legislature can't see what they're appropriating money to so they can spend it how they will we're trying to fix that um and but it's it's a it's a slow and very um, um, staff and time intensive process to get it done year by year. Senator, so what happens is those across the budget cuts, and when you get that over a couple of years, higher education is a high item in that in those figures. So they do get hit. Senator Tarr, I appreciate your appearance on the program today. As always, you introduce information in a way that we can all understand, even though sometimes it's very technical. Yeah, you know, I'm sorry about the technical side. That's that's my nature. Hey, no, we like that. No, we appreciate that no, very it's, much. It's that's great. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that you were a physical therapist at some time. I had a I have a daughter who practices now. So, good oh, for you. it's great. I tell you, it's uh, my first passion. Actually, my construction is probably my first passion. Physical therapy became my second. Okay, and, uh, it is an incredibly rewarding career. It sure is. You got any kids out there that are listening, or parents <laughs> that are listening? I would highly encourage you to get them in there. It's uh, it's a very rewarding and joyful uh, career to have thank you senator tar we appreciate your time thank you senator right. thank, thank you. you guys and, and maria bye-bye senate finance chairman eric tar at 903 on talk radio wr martinsburg